So it's a typical Tuesday. A man with really good fashion sense, one of the best you've ever seen, approaches you and offers you two choices, a red pill and a blue pill. You take red, you save the world and the simulation you were living in. But then, cool guy is back. Red or blue. You save that world and the simulation simulating the simulation. And he shows up again. Red or blue. And this happens over and over and over again. You can never seem to get to the real world. It's just one simulation after another. Is it possible that this is the reality we live in? To find out how deep the rabbit hole really goes, I have with me a special guest, Professor Florian Neukart, quantum computing and AI specialist from Leiden University. He's also the chief product officer of quantum technology company Terra Quantum. He, with his co-authors, have reviewed the subject of the simulation hypothesis. Thank you very much for joining me, Professor. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. All right. So uh, I, I just want to ask, like, is there even a rabbit hole? What's more likely is that there is no rabbit hole or there is a rabbit hole? It's very, very hard to answer. So there is no, no definite um, statement that I can give you about whether we live in a simulation or not. So I know there is a lot of opinions out there and um, people have strong opinions sometimes. Uh, about whether this is true or not, but very rarely ask, how can we verify, how can we prove if we live in a simulation or not? And this is something that we have been doing with this work. So think about um, ways how to find out whether the simulation hypothesis is true or not, whether we live and participate in a simulation chain or not. Um, I, I, I'm going to be honest, I'm a bit biased here. For, for a long time, when I've heard about this, I believed we live in the matrix. It just made sense to me. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that, uh, for example, makes me think we live in a simulation is that the universe seems to have a lot of um, lag protection measures. For example, there is a limit to the speed of light, how far we can see. If there is too much information in one spot, it, it coalesces into a black hole and warps time around it. Um, quantum states... They only collapse to one real outcome if they are interacted with or observed, as, as some uh, people would say. W what do you think of that? Like, that, that just doesn't seem like a coincidence. Yeah, so there are definitely a couple of things that are unexplained um, in the universe and that we need to study more. So these things that you mentioned, the constants, or some of the constants that we see and measure in the universe, also um, black holes um, and um, what happens to information, what happens to matter when it falls into a black hole. So these are questions that are highly um, debated um, and um, it's not solved. Yeah. So you could argue um, that these are um, ways of preventing the universe from becoming too complex. Um, and that's a thing because if we think about um, simulating a universe, so even if we assume there is an external programmer whose universe is based on different physical laws, they will have to have computational resources to do that simulation. And the more complex the simulation becomes over time, the more likely it is that the computational resources are exhausted at some point. So how do you prevent it from doing that? These are a couple of things, or there are a couple of things that you can do about this um, and um, these are the ones that we can try to find in our universe and look at and then maybe make a conclusion as to whether we live in a simulated universe or not. But, uh, I mean, there is another thing as well that makes it seem like we live in a simulated reality. For example, that the universe is pixelated. Planck length, mm -hmm. Planck time, mm -hmm. Planck mass, Planck temperature. Wouldn't you say that uh, this could be a result of us living in a matrix-like universe? So it's interesting, yeah. So that's our current understanding of physics. So quantum physics for now is the um, best studied theory um, and it's the, the best understood theory so far. So even though there are many things that we don't uh, know exactly, so it's, um, as you said, sort of pixelated, it's quantized. Um, the question is then, is there something else to discover that we haven't discovered yet? 
Um, but then thinking purely about quantum physics and um, simulating a universe, so other aspects become really, really interesting. When you think about designing a simulation or maybe even simulating our universe as a whole, quantum physics would prevent that because it's... Why, uh, why, would, that, be, why would that be the case, though? Because, so in the end, if I want to simulate, um, so let's say I want to simulate the the universe. Talking our, about our universe, universe, like the yes. 94 billion light years that we know of. Yes. Okay. Yes. And making a prediction about the future. So I must be more precise. That would be impossible. Because, so in the end, um, there is the uncertainty principle. There is um, ways of how we make predictions in quantum physics, which are statistical. Um, but it's not exact. It's not an exact science in the sense that I can look at a particle and always exactly predict what's going to happen in the future. So if I were now to simulate the universe with the purpose of making a prediction in the future, then that's not possible. That's also not possible for a couple other reasons, uh, one of which being uh, the size of the universe. So if I would have a computer or design uh, or want to simulate this universe, in its entirety, I would have to have a computer that in its internal state can um, assume every external particle state. So, and that means the computer must be bigger than the actual universe. So that's another reason for why it's not possible. So based on our current understanding of quantum mechanics, if we were to try and simulate a universe exactly the same size as our universe, that's quantized, pixelated to the same level, that's impossible. That's impossible. Yes, because it has to be simpler. It has to be simpler. Yeah, smaller. Yeah. So the the physical laws can be exactly as we understand them, but it cannot be the same size. So it must be smaller. And then again, if we were to simulate it, um, then um, uh, a simulation such that we can predict the future. So let's say we our our goal is to find out uh, what happens at the end of the universe to our universe exactly. So then it's going to be very hard um, because, for one, I cannot simulate the whole universe. And the other reason being is I cannot simulate it exactly. But what I can do is take the physical laws and uh, simulate a universe. And speaking, when I say a universe, I mean just a universe that's smaller than ours, say galaxies or galaxy clusters. And I simulate that. And then I look what's happening to these galaxy clusters over time. And that would allow me then to understand potentially what's happening at the end of the universe, whenever that happens. So let me ask you a question. For example, let's say I want to simulate a universe as big as ours, but instead of, instead of going down to the level of quarks, for example, I try and simulate just protons and neutron interactions, for yes. example, with the electrons. That's possible. So, but that would be an abstraction. In the end, what the assumption is and what our current understanding is, is that uh, from the smallest on the behavior of quarks, for example, um, I can make conclusions about the next bigger level, about protons, neutrons, and then about molecules, and then about larger systems. So if I were to simulate it exactly, I really have to start at the smallest level. The question would be, if I start only with protons and neutrons, so which is a level above what we understand, is that sufficient to uh, create a simulation that mimics the behavior of a subset of our universe? Um, it's hard to answer. We haven't done it. Um, but okay. right now, I would say we have to, as good as we can, down to the smallest level as we can, simulate um, the internal states of all systems. Um, so what, what if I tried to simulate, for example, just the solar system? Like mm -hmm. I would use resources more than just the solar system. Let's say I tried to use resources from the entire galaxy to simulate the solar system down to the Planck level, is that doable? Yeah, I think in the end, what you would have to have is um, a computer that can assume all internal states of all um, the bodies in the solar system, um, including um, the medium between um, the planets and the sun. And uh, then you would be able to potentially simulate the solar system, yes question would then be still is that enough because we for some things we we don't exactly understand so for example when you look at galaxies how they are held together so right now there is the assumption there's a prevailing assumption that there is something called dark matter 
Um, but is that really there? We cannot see it. We cannot really um, probe it. We can only indirectly assume it's there because our galaxies don't fly apart. So then the question would be, if there is something like that, does that have an influence um, on, on life, for example? We don't know. So if we were to simulate the solar system only, is that sufficient? Um, but in the end, I could do it. Yeah, sufficient. The question is always what you want to achieve. Yes, of course. Let's say I give you an infinitely powerful computer, like it has yes. unlimited resources, okay? Mm -hmm. Is there part of the physics that we understand that would still be impossible to simulate? You mentioned the uncertainty principle, for example. Yes. Can I simulate that? So for now, if you, well, if you had a computer that's infinitely powerful, yes, you could. So in that case, what we wish for is a quantum computer um, that's good enough to do it. Um, right now, we don't have these systems, unfortunately. We have small-scale quantum computers, and um, they are error-prone. They are not perfect, um, but uh, it would be, so to say, the killer use case if we were able to simulate molecules um, and atoms. So the idea, that's actually one of the reasons why quantum computing even started. Um, people like Richard Feynman thinking about why it's so hard using the regular computers that we use in our everyday lives to simulate quantum behavior. So the question came up then, does that mean if I build a computer that uses these quantum effects that are so hard to simulate, if it uses that for computation, is that computer more powerful? And it turns out it is. Now we're building these computers, but they're not good enough. So if you say there is a computer infinitely powerful, so I would assume, uh, or I would wish for a quantum computer that is perfect, error corrected, um, has perfect quantum bits, and then I could simulate quantum mechanically, um, even large-scale systems. I just want to, like, for my, I'm not a physicist, but I just want to know, like, the uncertainty principle, it's it's deterministic, right? Like, you can, if, if, you know, if you have enough information about the state of a quantum system, you can tell where it's going to go. Is that correct? So in the end, um, and that it brings me back to uh, quantum computing. I think this is a very good example. In the end, even if I, so if I understand theoretically, um, yes, but then the real world is always different. So it's uh -huh. very hard to isolate a quantum system. So for one, from its own irrelevant properties and from the properties of its environment. So there's always an influence that comes in that somehow um, um, hampers with my computation in a quantum computer. Um, it makes it hard. So even if I do everything right, um, then the, the system may still give me a prediction that's incorrect, an output that's incorrect, it's because it's a probabilistic system. So quantum systems in general are probabilistic systems. So that's why we also say um, that quantum systems are the only random number generators in the universe, um, only ones that are given by nature, because it's impossible to predict exactly what's going to happen to a system. So, so in future. theory, it might be doable, but extremely unlikely for it to happen. Yes. So okay. you can simulate, uh, um, but then again, so you have with these other constraints that we briefly discussed before in mind. Okay. So if some, if we had like an, a, an infinitely powerful, powerful civilization and they started a simulation chain, Right, with each chain, with each simulation, there's likely to be more and more errors um, uh, that they won't be able to account for. Would you say, is that correct? So, yeah, but here the question is also um, how you look at uh, the term error. So if you say you want uh, a simulation of the universe, say there is this uh, infinitely powerful civilization and they want to simulate their universe exactly, then over time, it becomes more and more inaccurate, deviates from the real thing, so to say. But the question would be, does that matter? Um, because if I'm only after simulating a universe, so not exactly the universe I'm in, but say I have my physical laws, I understood them to um, a detailed level, call this level X, and uh, down to that level X, I implement these physical laws in my simulation, and then I just let it do its thing. So the, the universe, the simulated universe will evolve. It will be different in terms of constellations of planets, for example, if we think about our universe and how galaxies look. But in the end, of the same physical law, similar structures will evolve. Um, and ideally, also a civilization uh, intelligent enough to start their own simulation. And again, then 
what you just mentioned is the simulation chain, then we would yeah. be in that sort of simulation chain. So basically, if a simulation chain happens, it's very difficult to avoid each progressive simulation to become more pixelated than the previous one. Yeah, so I think really what 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 this what everyone has to do and everyone has to deal with is um, their current environment, their current universe. So if I am now in a simulation, so and if I were to start um, a simulation, um, then I'm bound by the computational resources that I have in this universe, and uh, the universe that I can simulate must be smaller than my current one because I cannot build a computer that simulates our universe in its entirety. So if we go down the simulation chain, every next level simulation will be sort of smaller um, by nature because I'm always bound by the top level computational resources. And at some point, they'll be exhausted. Okay. Now, wh what do you think of this? The, the argument is that there's too many uh, physical parameters that are fine-tuned. For example, mm -hmm. the gravitational constant. If it was smaller... Uh, then uh, stars wouldn't form because gravity is not strong enough. Or yes. uh, the strong nuclear force, for example, if it was weaker, then you'd have only hydrogen existing, for example. Now, this is clearly an indication that if we were in a simulation, someone programmed these, these physical constants to be exactly as they are so that the, the universe, as we live in it, exists like this. What do you think yeah. of this? So it's a, yeah, that's an interesting proposal. And um, this is a, it's generally a, a hotly debated topic, as you know, um, because so exactly as you said, if these constants were not exactly as we measured them, like the gravitational constant and some others, then the universe wouldn't exist in its current form. So the question is natural to ask, why is that the case? And um, an assumption could, of course, be that there is an external programmer who took care of it. So in the sense of if I don't give these constants these values based on the physical laws that I implemented in this simulation, it wouldn't be possible, for example, for galaxies to form or for life to emerge. But is there like, for example, something that's not constant? For example, some kind of physics. This is, these are the common examples, but uh, let's say the uncertainty principle, for example. Maybe, maybe that's like the opposite of the gravitational constant. Like we don't need that to be exactly as it is. It can vary like much more. What do you think of that? Yeah. So here the question would then be why, if I was an external programmer, would I do something like that? And uh, the answer may be because I don't want to be able to predict exactly what's happening. I want to have oh. an evolution that's impossible to predict. So in, in the end, if I implemented quantum physics in my simulation, even if I was an external programmer, I cannot predict what's happening. Except, well, actually, an external programmer may be able to because they run the simulation and understand in more detail. But then for us internally in that simulation, it's going to be impossible to predict exactly what's going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't know. So an external programmer with all the resources they have, they can do many things. They can run the simulation at arbitrary speeds. They can um, reduce complexity if they... See, we run out of computational resources. And that's also the things that we propose in this paper and this research to look for. So what could an external programmer do um, if the universe over time just becomes so complex that computational resources run out or exhausted? So what would they do before the universe had to stop in order to continue running the simulation, so to say? Now, if we were living in a simulation, what would be more likely? Is that we are the only simulation that exists or we're part of a chain? I would say it's, uh, so if we are in a simulation, then it's very likely that there is a chain of simulations. That's not um, us being the first one uh, being simulated. So the question then also be, if you think of an external programmer, if they are the first ones. So it seems very unlikely to me um, if it happens, that it only happens once. So I would assume if it happens, then it will happen all the time. And then also it will happen in our universe that at some point we create a simulation um, and uh, try maybe just try to find out what happens in that simulation. How do they prevent um, in their simulations? So if they again create simulations, the exhaustion of computational resources, and can we 
then look at this. So imagine we run this at arbitrary speeds really fast until the end of the universe, until their computational resources run out. For them inside, it doesn't make a difference. But for us, we would be able to observe what they do in order to prevent the exhaustion of computational resources. And that's then something we can look at in our universe, look for in our universe to find out if we are part of a simulation chain. Okay. Now, this is also another question that I have. Is it possible, like, if, if there is a, like, there is a chain of simulations, right? Um, so yes. likely, the further away you are from, from the uh, real simulation, the real mm-hmm. world, not simulation, that's solid all, the less likely that mm-hmm. the simulator would know uh, what the other simulations would look like. Like, for example... Yep. Uh, if uh, we have world number one, and that's the real world, okay? And then we have world number 10, which is like 10th in the uh, simulation chain. They would have no idea what that looks like, probably, yeah. like th- because it's completely w- w- unimaginable to them. Would you say, is that correct? I, yeah, I agree, yeah. But very hard. So it could be completely different physical laws. Could be, so we, we always have to be careful not to anthropomorphize. Um, could be completely different um, beings, different from us, um, could be completely different universes. So um, in the end, um, uh, it's for us impossible to imagine what's outside this universe and uh, what an external programmer's universe might look like. And even harder to think about, as you said, the 10th level up. So what does that look like? We have no clue. What do you think is more likely? Like if... um there was someone, may, not someone, I don't want to anthropomorphize, like you say, if there's mm-hmm. something that made a simulated universe. And then, for example, say the gravitational constant has to be like this, and then the speed of light has to be like that, and then just lets it run. And then mm-hmm. somehow in this simulation, you end up with like Earth and life and all of that. Is it possible that uh, this something that created the simulation has no idea that life exists in this simulation. It could be, yes. could be, yeah. Um, if you would run that simulation, if I were to run that simulation, I think I would be very, very interested about anything dynamic that happens, anything um, that goes beyond just the physical simulation of um, atoms and molecules. So really, I mean, you could also assume or, or define humans at some point just being a bunch of atoms and molecules together. And that, uh, but if you if you think about life itself, um, so there are many different ways of how you can define life. But as we define it, with the intelligence and with consuming energy from the environment, transforming energy, etc. So this. Uh, this I would be looking for in my simulated universe. So even if it's completely different to what I think life is, um, I think if I would be able to create such a simulation, I would want to find out really hard if there is something similar to what I define as life in that universe, even if it looks different. So, um, But in the end, I think, yes, it could be possible that they don't know this because they have a very different definition of life than we have. So if I'm, I'm looking for that very definition only, I may overlook um, us, for example, if that's not something that qualifies as life in their opinion. Maybe uh, someone was just interesting, uh, interested in studying the physics of black holes, for example, and they yeah. ran a simulation just to make black holes. Yeah. They probably have no idea that could be, you know, yeah, absolutely, th- there's yeah. intelligent life. Could be, yeah. Um, but then the question would be, so if I, if, if I then observe um, the exhaustion of computational resources, so say they simulate black holes um, and they assign computational resources to that, but then there is this species that emerges somewhere that creates a computer to simulate a universe, which in turn, in the simulated universe, species emerges and creates a computer that simulates a universe and so forth then um, I would notice because of the computational resources needed. So I would then probably Ah. try to look for what's going on. So for example, maybe this intelligent species figures out how to turn a galaxy into a black hole. That would show up like as an error. Hold on a second. This is not supposed to happen. Something like that. Maybe it's a possibility. Maybe something like that. (laughs) What are they doing? Why are they building a Dyson sphere around this? What is going on? Uh, That's a possibility. Okay. Um, 
I want you to, uh, have you done, uh, do you know what React content is? Have you done React content? I'm going to show you some clips and I'd like to react to them. Is, is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, okay. Uh, all right, let me just uh, share real quick. Where is the share button? Share screen. Okay. Get the grass tight. Wait one second. All right, can you hear it? Can you hear us? Yeah, I hear it. Hold on, let me play it from the beginning. Give me a second. All right. Feel free to react to it. Any, like, if you want to say anything or hide any. Are we living in simulation? I find it hard to argue against that possibility. Meaning? Meaning. You look at our computing power today, and you say, I have the power to program a world inside of a computer. Well, imagine in the future where you have even more power than that, and you can create characters that have, for example, free will, or their own perception of free will. So this is a world, and I program in the laws that govern that world. That world will have its own laws of physics and chemistry and biology. Now, you're a character in that world, and you think you have free will, and you say, I want to invent a computer. So you do. <laughs> hey, I want to create a world in my computer. And then that world creates a world in its computer. And then you have simulations all the way down. So now you lay out all these universes and throw a dart. Which of these universes are you most likely to hit? The original one that started it? Or the countless simulations, the daughter simulations that... Uh, yeah, what, what do you think of what of Neil of said there? Tyson. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Neil deGrasse Tyson. So it's, uh, I know uh, his arguments and his, uh, his thoughts on it. Um, and um, partly, this was one of the reasons why we did this work. Because also here, so um, the assumption is just we live in a simulation, um, but there is no experiment or observation that tells us whether it's true or not. So in the end, what we want to do is find out if it's true or not, instead of just arguing it is true or not. Wouldn't you need, like, for example, right now you have um, general relativity and then you have uh, quantum mechanics and they don't agree with each other at, from yes. based on my understanding and mm -hmm. you would need to unify the two to really make some progress and find out if we if, if we're in simulation is that true um so certainly having a unified theory um describing all particles and fields um would help to understand and also to simulate um, but I'm not sure if it's needed um, to find out whether we live in a simulation or not. So you're right, they're, they're not reconciled. Um, and there is many, uh, are many interesting proposals out there. But I think I can look or we can look for other things too. Um, so to find out if, if the simulation hypothesis in that case is true or not. But of course, I agree. So uh, with, with having to reconcile these two, big theories. So if that were the case, then I could find out many more things about the universe. I could probably even um, do more accurate calculations and try to understand why it even started or how it started and predict into the future uh, what's going to happen. Right now, these are open questions. So we know um, down to um, a very um, uh, early time, 10 to um, minus 42 or so seconds, what happened. Um, but then what happened before and why did it even start? We don't know. All right. All right. I have another clip for you, if you don't mind. I'm just going to share again. No, please, yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, a second. All right, share. <clears throat> just give it, give it a second. And so the theory follows that may, maybe we're in the simulation. Have you thought about this? In a lot. For 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. Now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. Virtual reality, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. It would seem to follow that the odds that we're in base reality is one in billions. 
What do you think of uh, what Elon said? Yeah, no, I, I think it's also a very, very solid argument. Yeah. Um, so also that one I know. Um, but um, so here too, I think we need uh, scientific evidence. So we need experiments that help us to find out if it's true or not. But so I can follow the the line of reasoning here, and I agree. Yeah. Um, so the the chance we live in a simulation seems very high, but uh, we can't test it as of yet. No, we can't. Um, but maybe with a couple of experiments um, that hopefully also others will propose, we can find out. Yeah? Um, that's what what um, scientific evidence is all about, and the scientific methods really conduct reproducible experiments and then make a conclusion based on that. Right. Um, but if, right if, now, so I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, there are a couple of good arguments for why it could be the case um, that we are in a simulation. Um, if you can explain to me. Uh, like imagine I'm a you know ten year old for example, um, and you you want to tell me how you're going to uh, possibly conduct a test to find out if we are in a simulation. Like how would you uh, begin to do that? Like is there any other way? Like something specific in physics or something like that? Yeah, so we can look for a couple of things. So for one, um, I think the the most uh, reasonable thing to do would be really to start a simulation so and then we're there so then if we do that just to find out if we are part of a simulation uh, or we do that because we are very curious about whether we can do it i think it doesn't make a difference but then we are very likely in a simulation ourselves so if at some point we we are able to to conduct such simulations um, because then we would probably not be the first ones doing it because everyone else outside the external programmer and maybe many levels above would also have been curious. So the question then would be, if I run these a lot faster, um, these simulations, than our current time um, until the end of the universe, the simulated universe. Um, so what would um, these simulated beings with their simulated universes do to reduce the complexity? Um, so is that something that we can also observe in our universe? So I think that would be the first and the most reasonable way to do, but right now we don't have the computational capabilities to do so. So maybe there are some other things. The one um, thing that we could look for, and this sounds uh, very obscure, so in the context of physics, um, is uh, locally decreasing entropy. So we know that entropy, so based on thermodynamics, increases over time. But when you think about uh, simulating a universe, so even in the future, when you think about how we currently understand our universe, so that everything drifts uh, further apart. So, and then at some point, uh, we won't have planets anymore. They will uh, fall apart and dissolve into molecules, into atoms again. And then we'll have all the stars vanishing, the galaxies drifting apart. So the assumption would be actually the universe becomes more simple, easier to simulate over time as we see entropy increase. But that is not true because we have interactions between all the particles. Um, and then there is this quantum effect called entanglement. So the more interactions I have, the more entangled particles I have, the more complex the simulation actually becomes. So even if there are less objects in the universe as we, so less, less large objects in the universe, um, it becomes harder to simulate over time. So I must do something um, as the external programmer. I must somehow reduce the entropy. If I'm an external programmer, I can totally do that because I'm in control of the simulation. So is that something we can look for that we can detect? That could be um, another thing. And then maybe lastly, I mean, there are many more, but to mention one more thing is uh, right now, when you, when you look at uh, the most promising candidate for uh, unified theory, then it's string theory. So in string theory, in its um, most um, advanced form, comes still with 11 dimensions, with 10 space dimensions, one time dimension. But that's not what we observe in our universe. So string theory explains this by uh, postulating that um, the missing spatial dimensions, the missing seven spatial dimensions, are rolled up at the Planck scale, so very small, finite dimensions. And that could be a way for an external programmer to reduce complexity. So if you start out as an 11-dimensional universe or in an 11-dimensional universe, over time, you could just reduce infinite dimensions to finite dimensions. 
So that would be one way uh, of doing it. So because in string theory, if that is correct, um, the question still would be, why are these other special dimensions rolled up at the Planck scale? Why are they not infinite like the others? So that could be one way of doing it. Um, so that resulted in current physical laws too, yeah? Yeah. So based on my understanding, like if, for example, the string theory, we find that it's basically part, it's been programmed in a way so that the external software or PC, whatever mm -hmm. it is, basically is trying to not make the simulation take up too much computing power. If we find yes. a lot of ways to, if we, if we find a lot of evidence that there's too many ways to reduce complexity, basically for the computer not to blow up, mm -hmm. that's, that's evidence that we live in a simulation. So the more and yeah. more of that we find out, the more likely we live in a simulation. I would agree to that, yes. Okay. Uh, I have uh, just uh, one more clip, and then uh, mm -hmm. before, uh, before we wrap, don't go anywhere, by the way. We need to upload. The video needs to upload. But I would I'd yes. like you to react to this as well. <laughs> yes. All right, hold on. Let me share this video as well. Screen. All right. Can you see? All right, here we go. Three, two. <laughs> So isn't that proof that we live in a simulation? That's definitely. <laughs> well, we don't need uh, to go to black holes or any of that. There's a proof right there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it looks very simulated. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> um, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Florian, for uh, coming in. I just uh, want to do one last thing. Um, now, you're one of the foremost experts on the simulation hypothesis. Um, and trying to find out ways to whether we live in a simulation or not. I just want to reveal that this was all a test. Okay. And I have with me right here one red and one blue M&M. &M. Which one would you choose? What, what are the options? Uh, uh, red, uh, red or blue. Oh, that's not the blue M&M. &M. This is the blue M&M. &M, sorry. <laughs> uh, the red, red uh, is you see how the how deep the rabbit hole goes. Blue, you get to go home and try to find out if we live in a simulation, and uh, it's going to be a very hard job. Yeah, I'll take the blue one then. <laughs>